Hi Booktube, it's Andrew here and I'm just going to give you my thoughts on the new Michelle Morgan book which is called The Girl, um, Marilyn Monroe, The Seven Year Itch and The Birth of an Unlikely Feminist. This is due out at the end of, Mar uh, end of May, although some people have received copies um, already. It has been published in the States already, it's due out in the UK at the end of the month. So, basically in this book Michelle describes how she discovered Marilyn Monroe and how Marilyn as a person and as an actress transcends generations. So she tells of her first watching The Seven Year Rich, the film in question on the, on the, of the title, uh, with her grandparents and then with her own daughter Daisy for the first time and how it all came across as so innocent and fun and but how each generation discovers her and, and she transcends times. She discusses why Marilyn admitted to posing for the nude calendar and her honesty. The fact that she refused a film called The Girl in Pink Tights when she was under contract to 20th Century Fox and really had no choice in the matter. She should have done it. Um, her contract stated that she would appear in whatever they decided, regardless of whether she liked it or not. And then on to The Seven Year Itch, which is of course where the title of the book comes from, The Girl. The Girl being the name of the character because when George Axel wrote the book he had no idea of what to call, or wrote the play, he didn't know what to call the main female character, so she's just referred to as the girl. And also it discusses the mayhem caused by the shooting of the famous uh, skirt scene. There's also a bit in here which discusses how women's roles were perceived in the 1950s, and this is very important because when people think of Marilyn Monroe, they think of her as a dumb blonde, a bimbo, uh, and so on, somebody who was just there for to, to pleasure men, which is what all women were supposed to be doing in the 50s, um, when in fact she wasn't. She was an independent person who formed her own production company at a time when most women were still chained to the kitchen sink. So, um, what this book does is it gives us some um, examples. For instance, in the 1955 issue of the Australian Women's Weekly, there was a competition to win a new car. However, instead of the kind of trivia questions one would expect to answer today, the competition centred on the qualities of an ideal wife and mother. And this article is knowing rare. It was a rule more than an exception to show women safely at home cooking and cleaning. And adverts during the 50s confirm this. Educational films of newly married couples had an emphasis on what a wife's role should entail. One such production released by Coroner Instructional Films in 51 presented a young couple going through various stresses over the course of a year of marriage. The wife was shown as having given up her job after the wedding to maintain a happy house for her husband. She spent her day cooking, cleaning, organising bridge parties and seething that her husband visits his mother too often. So this goes on to you know, to show that this is what was expected of women back in the 1950s. There's another story here about um, um, a woman, when Marilyn divorced Joe DiMaggio, um, there's a paragraph that says, as she walked out of the courtroom and into a new life, another marriage was about to end in a far more tragic way. Santa Monica court reporter Max Silbert was covering the Monroe DiMaggio divorce and his 28-year-old wife, Selma, asked if she could go along with him. He agreed and as Max worked in the thick of the action, his wife sat at the back of the courtroom and observed Marilyn giving her testimony. No one will ever know what went through her mind as she watched the proceedings unfold, but at the end of the case, Selma Silbert calmly picked up her purse and walked to the nearby Bay City's building. There she was to meet her husband for lunch. Instead of going to the restaurant, the woman walked up to the 10th floor restroom. Once there, she opened the window as far as it would go, balanced herself on the windowsill and threw herself out. She landed on top of an adjoining building where she died instantly. In the newspapers the next day it was stated that she had been upset and tried to take her life on several occasions in the past. In reality she was suffering from postpartum depression after giving birth to her last child just the year before. So just goes to show how not only were women just expected to stay at home to cook clean and look after the kids but it also doesn't take their mental health seriously. Postpartum depression, postnatal depression wasn't talked about and some people still think of it as not being a real condition. It is unfortunate I haven't suffered from that. I'm very lucky and I know it. Um, but women did and women took their lives because of it. It's awful. 
So Marilyn uh, was thinking of her future while making The Seven Year Rich and not long after completion of the film, she flew to New York and formed her own production company with Milton Green, which is where this book really comes into its own. We learn all about the, the forming of the production company, which we've probably read many, many times before in other books, but other books don't deal with it as sensitively and as calmly as Michelle. They're always trying to over sensationalize things and make it more scandalous than it is. Whereas Michelle just states the facts and gets on with it. She explores why Marilyn wanted to form her own production company. Why she wasn't happy just being a wife and mother. Although that is something that she did want at a point in her life. Um, and explores the reasons why Marilyn is a role model, is a feminist, a very early feminist. She would have expected pretty much to give up her career, get married and have children. She chose not to. She did try to get married. She did get married three times. The first time to James Dougherty and that ended in divorce uh, when she became a model. Joe DiMaggio who married Marilyn Monroe and then wanted her to stay at home, which to me is bizarre. And then, of course, Arthur Miller, with whom she really wanted to have children. But she didn't want to give up her career as well. She wanted to be an actress. She wanted to be independent. Now, prior to Marilyn Monroe, only two or three, if that, women, two, two other women had formed their own production companies. Mary Pickford was one of them, forming United Artists with Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And I think there was one other one, and I can't think who it is off the top of my head. Um, but not many women did. She was a savvy businesswoman. She set up her own production company because she wanted better roles. She didn't want to play the dumb blonde. She wanted to play better roles. She wanted to play Grushenka in The Brothers Karamazov, which um, people made a joke of. Uh, but why? She could have done it. She wanted to play Lady M in the Scottish play in Macbeth. She probably could have done it. Maybe not on the stage because stage, stagecraft is totally different, but definitely in film. And Michelle explores that all the way through. Um, the book goes up to, let me just see. Um, I'm just going to have a look. It goes right through, uh, you know, to, to the end of her life really, but not in depth. We've got bits on bus stop, The Prince and the Showgirl, obviously with Laurence Olivier. Um, and it, it does kind of end around that period, the, the actual story and about them getting married. And I'm just going to flip through to, it's been a while since I've read this, I'm going to read it again really soon, about the power struggles through, between Olivier uh, Green and Monroe during the filming of The Prince and the Showgirl, which is a beautifully film, filmed movie, thanks to Jack Cardiff. Um, and how bad time it was because she, uh, because of the, the way that British equity worked, there weren't many Americans allowed to work on the film, which is fair enough because we wanted the jobs to go to British people. So of course, Olivier was surrounded by his friends and cronies and people he'd worked with many times before. And Marilyn really had nothing and that probably made her feel very alone. And that's a ho horrible thing. You know, and it was after The Prince and the Showgirl that they, that she tried to make a life with Miller, having, trying to have children, and, and, and sadly that didn't happen. Also about her work at the actor's studio and how well she did. Um, and about her charity work. She did a lot of charity work. So she worked for the Milk Funds Babies and March of Dimes, gave time to the orphanage that she lived in, and said in 1952 to Oella Parsons, I want to lead a drive to do something personal for orphans. Not just the usual thing of sending dolls or food to an orphanage. I mean something intimate. Actual contact with the children. It's the most awful thing in the world to feel that you have nobody to love you. And then again, the thing she did, the way she stood up for people and small businesses and the individual, the man in the street, um, on the set of Let's Make Love. Marion discovered that the studio coffee vendor had been told his services were no longer required. Furious, she took a complaint to Fox executives, who eventually relate, relented and allowed the seller to return with his reflection card. Marion showed further support by gathering co-stars Eve Montfort Jean, and Gene Kelly to have photos taken with the vendor and his drinks. I think we've all seen that, actually. 
another time uh, on learning of the death of a, a crew member's wife. Um, she walked up to him, put a roll of bills in his hand and walked away. She didn't say anything, it was, you know, it was just to help him defer the cost of the funeral, which even in the, back in the early 60s was a very expensive thing. There's a lovely section at the end of the book called Passing the Torch. And this bit is about people whose lives have been touched by Marilyn. So we've got Susie Kennedy, the fantastic um, impersonator. I won't call her a lookalike because she's more of an actress than a lookalike. She doesn't just look like Marilyn, she acts like Marilyn. She's absolutely, and she's a fantastically wonderful human being, like Marilyn. Tara Hanks, who was an author who, who wrote The Mmm Girl, fantastic. Daisy Morgan, Michelle's daughter. Myself. <laughs> Susan Griffiths, again, another actress, again, who played tribute to Marilyn in films such as Pulp Fiction, Marilyn Marie, and she was in an episode of Quantum Leap. Emma Watson, and some of these are ones that, that people have, have said. Emma Watson and Michelle Williams, Gloria Steinem, and uh, one of our favourite, Linda Kerridge, who was a very, very big tribute artist and look like back in the 1980s, died in the film Fade to Fat with Dennis Christopher, uh, among other things. An absolutely fantastic little section of why Marilyn's touched people's hearts and souls and given them something to aim for and to achieve. And then the last bit is A Woman of Culture, which basically gives a list of books, poems and plays that she read, studied, performed, admired, etc, etc. And actors, writers, philosophers and philanthropists and scientists she admired, musicians and composers that she liked, and the artists and sculptors she liked. So under musicians and composers, we have uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Earl Bostick, Ludwig van Beethoven, of course. Uh, and and others and uh, writers we've um, actors writers philosophers philanthropists and, and scientists we've got Albert Einstein Franz Kafka Carl Sandburg Karen Blixen Leo Tolstoy Eleanor Duse Mary Dressler and uh, books plays and poems we've got Sweet Honey and Desire by Tennessee Williams Bernard Shaw Mr Patrick Campbell their correspondence by Bernard Shaw Brothers Kalamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Enemy of the People by Ibsen, Fallen Angels by Noel Coward, Hamlet by William Shakespeare, uh, Lysistrata by Aristophanes, Middle of the Night by Paddy Chayefsky. Then we've got the Poem Never Give All the Heart by William Yeats, Rain by Somerset Maugham, To the Actor by Michael Chekhov, and so on. So it's a well-rounded mini biography of a certain point in Marilyn's life, giving us an overview of why she is one of the first feminists. And why you, if you, even if you don't like her as an actor and you don't like her films, why as a person she is so influential, even now, in 19, well in, 19, in 1962 she died, it's now 2018. So we're looking at 50, odd years, 56 years since she died and yet she's still one of the most influential women in the world and that says it all really. I will leave a link to the uh, uh, Amazon UK and Amazon.com where you can purchase a copy of the book The Girl by Michelle Morgan. I do recommend it, it's a lovely little book, go out and get it, great photos, let me know what you think if you've read it, um, in any comments below, if you've liked this video give it a thumbs up, you can subscribe if you want to. I'm gonna make these videos whether you, whether you like them or not. So um, yeah, so do go out and, and buy the girl. I do recommend it if you want to know more about Marilyn Monroe as a person rather than as an image. That's all for now. As you can hear, Jennifer's kicking off in the background. She's getting a bit peckish, so I'm gonna go and feed her now, and I will see you all soon. Bye now.